following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, as the case may be. That's one of the wonderful things about Internet radio. You can listen whenever and wherever you want. Welcome to another edition of Ask Claire on the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. I'm your host. My name is Claire Hall, and uh, we talk about a wide range of topics on this program with a wide range of interesting people. But in the several months I've been doing this program, this one will be a first because it's my first return guest. My uh, uh, dear friend, uh, Scott Russell, who, how do you, Scott Russell defies easy description. He, I think of him as a Ron Ran- Couture, a Renaissance man, an author, a baseball statistician, and a nut. And I mean that in a uh, in a very good way. Hey, Scott, welcome, and I hope I haven't chased you off already. No, not at all. In fact, um, I believe my greatest attribute is, is being that nutcase. So <clears throat> I think if any one of those descriptions defines me, it would be nut, yes. <laughs> and incidentally, your timing was amazing when we started this, when we began this recording, because as soon as <clears throat> you put me on, I swallowed incorrectly and started coughing uh, oh, Lord. uncontrollably. No, no, no one will have to perform the Heimlich maneuver at this point. Although at one point <laughs> in my life, I, I seem to remember being removed from an airline flight when I attempted to give... Uh, I, I attempted to perform a Heimlich maneuver on a uh, lovely Swedish airline stewardess. The only <laughs> problem is uh, she wasn't choking, so I got into a bit of trouble. Oh, with. yeah, I can imagine that. I can imagine that. Well, uh, for all of you who are uh, lucky or unlucky enough to have stumbled across this conversation, uh, please know Scott and I connected on Facebook over a shared passion for baseball, but we have found that our uh, interests, you know, that is uh, the common thread binding our friendship together, but we've found that we share other interests as well, pretty wide-ranging, a love of great writing, great literature, and, uh, you know, and uh, one of the great writers who we both have great admiration for, but uh, is really, I know, Hi, in your pantheon, Scott, is Mr. Pete Hamill. So let's start the program. Uh, you know, sad to say, but there may be a younger generation who doesn't know Pete Hamill. So I want you to start off by uh, introducing him to the audience, please. Of course. Well, I grew up in New York City, <clears throat> although my wife would uh, probably attest to the fact that I have not as yet grown up, uh, <laughs> but growing up in New York City um, as a young man and a young impressionable man, um, I began reading voraciously. In fact, the reason I write today is because I read. I think in order to write, you really have to read and read a lot. Yes. My favorite columnist in the 1960s and 70s and even to this day remains Pete Hamill. Pete Hamill was a columnist for the New York Daily News, the New York Post, Long Island Newsday, I believe, briefly, the Village Voice, and many other journals. And I just love the way not only he wrote, but uh, his heart was always in the right place. And recently, back in uh, in fact uh, a little over a year ago, I wrote a novel, and the novel is an apolitical novel entitled Prophet's End, and Prophet would be P-R-O-P-H-E-T apostrophe S, and it's an apolitical novel, as I said, and Pete Hamill, Pete Pete Hamill's actually a a chief character in the story. 
And the novel was not only dedicated to Pete Hamill, but it's it, it pays uh, homage homage to uh, first responders and an impossibly beautiful, inspirational young woman named Jennifer Bricker. But Pete, uh, I, I just. He, he just amazed me uh, back in the 60s uh, growing up. I just, as I traveled to and from my jobs in New York City, uh, there were approximately at least six major dailies. At one time, there were perhaps like a dozen major dailies in New York City. But many of these major dailies were printed uh, several times each day. Uh, and released several times each day. The New York Daily News had like a, a one-star edition, a two-star edition, and all the way up to like five stars. Um, so at various times of the day, whether or not you were going to work, coming back from work, you just had attended a game at Madison Square Garden, uh, you could pick up the latest edition of these tabloids and read the latest ruminations, the most recent ruminations, of your favorite author, and mine was Pete Hamill. And each day that I read Hamill's work, I was hoping that he had a bad experience that day. That's a heck of a thing to say, but I did, because <laughs> he was so sensitive to injustice that when he experienced uh, injustice, he, he wrote with a passion and a flair uh, that was unmatched by any other writer of his day, and that includes greats like Jimmy Breslin, Mike Royko in Chicago. So after writing this book, in which, as I said, Pete Hamill is a character, a chief character in Prophet's End, I attempted to reach Mr. Hamill. <clears throat> and each time I, I reached one of his representatives or his publisher, there was almost a cloak of, of secrecy. Uh, there was some sort of protective cocoon placed around Pete Hamill. It's almost as if that this was an impenetrable cocoon, and I was not going to be made privy as to what was going on with him. He had just disappeared. He wasn't making any public appearances, no speaking appearances. He wasn't writing, and I had no idea why... I was being blocked from, inform, uh, from informing my idol that I had written a book which had him as, as a chief character. And quite a, quite a time went by, and finally I was in line one day, and I noticed that there was this story about Mr. Hamill having this awful accident in which he fell, and broke both, uh, he broke both hips simultaneously. Ooh. Ooh. Now keep in mind that at the time this happened, he was already 80 years old. Right. And to, and, and to try to, to really understand how devastating this must have been, Pete Hamill covered the news in New York via foot. No matter yes. where he went to cover news, he walked whether or not it was 14th Street, 59th Street, Central Park, Harlem, uh -huh. any place. He walked. And Pete did not have a driver's license until he was 36 years old. And I don't even believe that uh, that he, he actually used it that much. Number one, I grew up in New York City myself, as I said, and I don't have a driver's license to this day because I took subways everywhere. Or I walked. So I, I really identified with Pete Hamill in, in so many instances, and, but obviously not in writing. I mean, <laughs> writing, that's an, and he's, he's an entirely different category. Um, mm -hmm. So when I read about the devastating accident he had, I started fearing the worst. Here's an 80-year-old man, now approximately 83 or 84, uh, having this devastating injury, can you imagine breaking both hips simultaneously, especially for an active, athletic person? He had the gait of a teenager 
well into his late 70s and probably until until the accident. So, uh, and now I, I began understanding why he had disappeared from the public eye, or or perhaps attempting to to comprehend. So one day I'm on a line and I noticed a four year old video, which showed Pete speaking. He had a speaking engagement at a place called Glucksman Ireland House at the, on the campus of NYU, New York University. Mm-hmm. And I watched the video, and on a whim, I decided to call Glucksman Ireland House. Perhaps they can inform me how to reach Mr. Hamill. And as I said, I feared for the worst, because, you know, at that age, you start thinking, is there dementia? Is that why he's he's out of the public eye? You don't know. So I I called Glucksman Island House, and this woman answered, identified herself as Miriam Nyhan Gray. And, ah. and she had this wonderful, wonderful uh, Irish brogue. And I initiated the conversation by saying, Miss Gray... I am a huge fan of Pete Hamill's. In fact, he's my idol. And I noticed a couple of years ago that he had spoken uh, at Glucksman Island House. And I said, this call is is going to be very unusual. And and she said, trust me, with her lovely Irish brogue, we receive a lot lot of (laughs) unusual calls on a daily basis. So, um, and I told her I informed her of my uh, attempts to reach Mr. Hamill, and then she assured me that, ah, I speak to Peter, she called him Peter, at least twice a a week. So if you send this book to me, I will be certain to hand it to him personally. Well, I not only sent the book to Miriam Nyhan Gray and personalized it to Pete Hamill, uh, I also sent Miriam a copy and personalized it to her since she was so sweet in in assisting me. Well, approximately four months go by. I did not hear a thing. And I started thinking, oh, well. And incidentally, she got my inference when I said that I, I feared the worst. She said, I can assure you sure. that Peter Peter is has full faculties. So she knew exactly what I was inferring at that point. Well, four months, as I said, go by, and suddenly I receive an email. An email that says, Dear Scott, since Pete Hamill is your hero, we're having a tribute for him at NYU's Glucksman Ireland House on Monday, December 10th. Are you interested in attending? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> you would move heaven and earth if necessary, I'm sure. Yes. Uh-huh. And, and uh, this is a story I, 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 I have told several times already, but I'll harken back to the mid 1970s. And I have a dear friend who used to pitch for the Boston Red Sox, a very eccentric character named Bill Spaceman Lee. And one of the things that uh, he pitched for the Red Sox, of course, and, and, and one, of the, uh, one of the factors that uh, pretty much cemented our friendship was the fact that Bill and I both admired the great novelist Kurt Vonnegut. One day in the mid-70s, I called Bill up and said, Vonnegut is speaking at the Boston Globe Book Festival. So, are you interested in joining me? And he said, I'm in. He said, I'm in. Well, we both attended, and Vonnegut enthralled us. He spoke for 45 minutes and we laughed, we cried. It was an amazing, he's just an amazing, he was an amazing speaker, Kurt Vonnegut. At the end of 45 minutes, it was announced on the PA system that Kurt Vonnegut would be out in the corridor 
personalizing copies of his new book, which I believe then was, uh, oh, what was the name of his book then? The book that Kurt Vonnegut, because it's on my shelf here, it mm-hmm. was, uh, so, oh, Slapstick. In the past, oh, yeah. I, uh, in the past, I might have said it was Timequake, but it, I looked it up and it was Slapstick. So, uh, I told Bill, I said, well, let's go see Vonnegut, let's go meet Vonnegut. And Bill Lee is one of the most gregarious, outgoing, you know, eccentric characters in the world. But Bill looked at me and said, Scotty, I'll meet you outside afterwards. I said, excuse me? This is your opportunity to meet Kurt Vonnegut, our hero. And Bill Lee looked at at me and said, I'd rather leave my idols at a distance. Ah. Well, I, I, I I didn't understand it. This is approximately 1976. However, when I received the opportunity to to meet Pete Hamill some 42 years afterwards, (laughs) I suddenly Uh understood. Suddenly it hit me right between the eyes what Bill was trying to tell me back then. And so it's just amazing. And in early November... And I realize I'm going off on a tangent here. Okay. Uh, That's okay. In in early November, Peg and I, my wife Peg and I, my long-suffering bride of 34 years, we attended a uh, a sports memorabilia show at the Wilmington Shriners Auditorium. The wonderful Shriners Hospital uh, runs that and Shriners Hospital for Children. And at this particular <coughs> sports memorabilia show, there were approximately 22 members of the world champion 2018 Boston Red Sox. So you can wow. imagine, the crowd was huge. Uh, Dwight Evans, uh, Fred Lynn, Jim Rice of the 1975 Red Sox were there, various other sports personalities, But one of the guests was Tom Berenger, the great actor. Oh, wow. Tom Tom Berenger is one of my my favorite. In fact, he's my favorite male actor. Mm -hmm. And the reason he is is because in 1979, he appeared in a television motion picture titled uh, Flesh and Blood. Flesh and Blood was based on Pete Hamill's novel, Flesh and Blood, which Pete had uh, written in 1977. It became a television movie in 79. So uh, in the in the book, uh, and of course in the movie, Tom Berenger played a character named Irish Bobby Fallon. The book is very, it's a hard-hitting book, and it details... Uh, the brutality in boxing. Well, here we are online, Peg and I, to meet Tom Berenger. And everyone there, now you might want, you might ask, uh, you may ask why, why uh, uh, Tom Berenger is appearing at a sports memorabilia show. That's because yeah, Tom Berenger. Man. <laughs> and that's yeah. because Tom Berenger appeared in the motion picture Major League. Oh, yes. And that is why he was there. That was the sports Uh game. So Peg and I are lined up to meet Tom Berenger. Everyone on the line, and I mean invariably, everyone had a poster of Tom Berenger in in Major League for him to sign. Wow. All except Peg and I. Ah. We had a copy of Pete Hamill's Flesh and Blood. Uh-huh. So they're, they're calling out the people to meet Berenger by number, and finally they called our number out, and we approached Mr. Berenger. And I, I, I looked at Tom, and I said, uh, Mr. Berenger, uh, you are my favorite actor. 
And he looked up at me, and he noticed I was carrying a copy of Flesh and Blood. And he said, well, this is kind of refreshing. Are you, are you the only two people in this place who aren't seeing me because of my appearance in Major League? I said, apparently. <laughs> and then he said something which really amazed me. This is this is instant karma right here, or, or it's, it's a sign. It's kind of a sign. It's cosmic. Tom Berenger said, you know, I was just thinking that mo- about that movie yesterday. Wow. And then I never mentioned to him that I was going to meet Pete Hamill. But he looked up at me and said, you know, Pete, Pete Hamill's a great guy. And, oh, and, wow. So the entire thing was cosmic. And to make okay. things even... Even more amazing, Tom Berenger signed the book to Scott and Peg, God bless, and he didn't sign it Tom Berenger, he signed it Irish Bobby Fallon, the character he played in the movie and in Hamill's book. Oh, fabulous, fabulous. So the entire thing was kind of cosmic, and of course, uh, on Monday, December 10th, we indeed attended uh, the tribute uh, for Pete Hamill at NYU's Glucksman Ireland House. Um, actually, it wasn't exactly at, at Glucksman Ireland House. It was on the campus of NYU because the actual fraternity was a little too small to accommodate the few hundred people uh, that did attend. Uh, if I may, Claire. Yes. Uh, yes. I would like to read uh, what I I wrote on social media about my meeting with Pete Hamill. Yes, please do, Scott, please. Of course, and, and this is it. Um, I called it Life and Other Antiquities. And again, please forgive my New York accent for those of you who are having difficulty understanding me. You know, but I, I, I am attempting to, to minimize my New York accent. Normally, it would sound something like, yo, hey, Vinny, throw me the ball, man. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, I'll, I'll attempt to minimize it. But it's called Life and Other Antiquities. There was a time in the irretrievable past that some people engaged in civil discourse and overwhelming intolerance was not the norm. Implausibly as it may seem, there existed intelligent conservative Republicans such as the great Jackie Robinson and William F. Buckley. This was a glorious time before right-wing liberals, and I say liberals in quotation marks, spewed their invective, a time before an inarticulate cretin of a president so unnerved them that they were moved to unintentionally prove what the legendary Mort Saul attempted to teach us, that the far left and far right were one and the same. During this glorious bygone period, great journalists roamed the streets of our cities. None greater, though, than my idol, the incomparable Pete Hamill. Pete Hamill, the son of immigrants who hailed from Belfast in Northern Ireland, graced the pages of the New York Post, the New York Daily News, the Village Voice, and numerous other journals. There existed no subtlety in Hamill's writings, just a powerful Mike Tyson or an Irish Bobby Fallon-like punch in the mouth. Each morning or late afternoon, there were morning and evening editions of most major dailies, as I rode the IRT to Manhattan to or from my places of gainful employment, I would stop at a newsstand with the hope that Pete Hamill had perhaps experienced a bad cup of coffee or been witness to some form of inequity. I was never disappointed upon reading Hamill's chronicles, all of which were written with a passion and brutal honesty I had never before seen. As the son of Billy Hamill and the former Annie Devlin, Pete was raised with compassion for the poor, the oppressed, the disadvantaged, and the downtrodden. His sensitivity to injustice was palpable and manifested itself through his powerful words. Two evenings ago, 
thanks to a lovely young woman named Miriam Nyhan Gray, the Associate Director of Glucksman Ireland House of NYU, I was privileged to meet my idol, the one and only Pete Hamill. I was hesitant for many years. I had invariably left my heroes at a distance. However, Ms. Gray insisted that I do so. Nonsense, she exclaimed in her wonderful Irish brogue. You traveled a long distance to meet Peter. Peg, my long-suffering bride of 34 years and I, invited two guests to a tribute to Pete Hamill at New York University's Rosenthal Pavilion. Our dearest friends, Dr. Vladimir Priven, a brilliant endocrinologist at New York's Lutheran Hospital, and his lovely wife, Dr. Violetta Thurbach, both immigrants, much like Pete Hamill's brave parents who had emigrated here to find a better life. As Peg and I entered the auditorium in which the tribute was to take place, I peered around the room and noted that the vast majority of the crowd were our contemporaries. That is, they all appeared to be senior citizens, all seemingly from a nearly extinct era, all harking back to the days during which New Yorkers were privileged to, see, to read the prose of Jimmy Breslin, Jimmy Cannon, and, yes, Pete Hamill. The dais resembled an all-star team of legendary journalists. One by one, they each paid homage to Pete Hamill with remembrances that were both hilarious and poignant. On several occasions, I had to wipe the tears that were welling in my eyes. The presenters were each extraordinary writers. Ms. Miriam Nyhan Gray read tributes from Gloria Steinem and the Babe Ruth of Salsa, the magnificent Ruben Blades, the genius singer, songwriter, actor, and activist from Panama. I left out the politician, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> there was Dan Barry, James McBride, Mike Lupica, Joanna Malloy, Jim Dwyer, Mike Barnacle, Sam Roberts, Peggy Noonan, Carl Hyacin, Charles Sinat, and, of course, Dennis Hamill, the younger brother of Pete, who himself is an outstanding novelist in his own right. The legendary folk singer Judy Collins concluded the proceedings with a rousing rendition of Amazing Grace, and we all joined in. There were numerous other renowned writers in the audience. There won't be any more Pete Hamels. Of this, I'm certain. We've gone from Frank Sinatra to Kanye, from Stravinsky to, to from, uh, from Stravinsky to Tiny Tim, from the Drifters to Justin Bieber, from Sidney Poitier to Charlie Sheen, from Marjorie Hepburn to Lindsay Lohan. Mozart has indeed gone blind, and most youngsters could not tell you who Pete Hamill is or who Mike Royko was. But they know the names of hip-hop artists who objectify, objectify and denigrate women. And if a motion picture does not include sorcerers, dinosaurs, or vampires, well, no thanks. <laughs> nonsense. nonsense, exclaimed lovely Miriam Nyhan Gray with her beautiful Irish brogue. You traveled a long distance to meet Peter. The great Pete Hamill, who in recent years has endured heart problems, type 2 diabetes, and suffered a fall in which he broke both hips simultaneously, peered deeply into my eyes, grasped my hand firmly, and spoke. Thank you, he said. Thank you. During our trip back to Vladimir and Violetta's home in Brooklyn, birthplace of my idol, Pete Hamill, I was strangely silent. Those that know me are aware of that being an extremely remote possibility. <laughs> Finally, Dr. Vladimir Privman broke the silence. So, Scott, are you ever going to wash your hand again? And that was <laughs> it. That, that was my evening meeting my idol, Pete Hamill. And it's uh, Pete. That, yes. And Pete almost died as we found out, and that is the reason he's been out of it for a couple of years. He literally almost yeah. died. At one sure. time, the doctors were ready to pack it in. He pretty much had to be brought back. 
Um, today, he walked up to the stage with the use of a walker, and yet I'm telling you right now that he's eventually going to ditch that walker. No question. No question in, in our minds because he seemed to be doing pretty darn well. And as Miriam said, he has full faculties. Um, the man's still amazing. And he gave this incredible, rousing speech at the end. And I'm telling you, but but to see all those journalists there, I mean, Carl Hyas and Charles Sinat, Peggy Noonan, Sam Roberts, Mike Barnacle, Jim Dwyer, Joanna Malloy, Mike Lupica, James McBride, Dan, Dan Barry, and, of course, his brother, Dennis Hamill. To see all of these people offering their, their remembrances and uh, just these anecdotes about Pete, it was an amazing evening. So I guess I now have nothing to look forward to, Claire. Oh, you'll find oh, something, Scott. 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 How, about, yeah. how about looking forward to Cooperstown, the summer of 2021, and when you and I and Lou Patterson Cisco and Russ White and Irene Hodges and all of us, uh, many, many more who have been among the Gill Hodges faithful, gather to celebrate Gill's long, long overdue induction to the Hall of Fame. There's one that, thing to look forward to. That would be wonderful. I, I sincerely hope it does happen. Uh, I, I can tell you that um, I, I lost a lot of respect for the Baseball Hall of Fame uh, because they pretty much neglected our study on Gil yep. Hodges, which definitively proved not that he needed any uh, basis, uh, you know, for, for his, uh, his enshrinement, uh, he accomplished everything and, uh, for him to, uh, his, his, uh, I'm telling you, I, I get angry when I even think about it, but yeah. his exclusion to me is still the greatest injustice of all. Agreed. Agreed. My friend, you know, we are out of time. We're even a little bit past time. We talked about uh, talking more about heroes and idols, but I think that'll need to wait for another program. So will you come back again in a few weeks? Gladly, if anyone will have me. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I always will. So until Ralph kicks me off the network, uh, I think we've got an ongoing date. Scott Russell, my friend, it has been a joy to have you again on Ask Claire. Thank you to everybody listening, and until next time, happy trails.